Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to our webinar this morning entitled Into the Unknown Guidance for Landlords and Tenants on Renewing and Terminating Leases. I uh, hope you're all well wherever you're tuning in from, uh, and thank you for sharing your time with us this morning. Um, my name is Paul Henson. I'm a real estate disputes partner in our national real estate disputes team. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, James Walters, who is a solicitor in the Real Estate Disputes team. Uh, hello, James. Hello, Paul. Um, now, there's going to be a predominantly commercial property focus to what we cover today, uh, but where appropriate, we'll also uh, briefly address uh, any residential property issues. Um, and our aim really today is to cover some of the changes that have been implemented as a result of the COVID-19 restrictions uh, and the various government interventions, both in primary and secondary legislation. Uh, and to provide some practical advice for landlords and tenants uh, on the issues they should consider uh, if they wish to terminate or renew a lease. Um, I think the first step is probably acknowledge just how significant recent events have been uh, on the real estate sector within uh, in the UK. Um, we've seen the greatest restrictions on the rights of property owners and users and obviously the public in general uh, during peacetime. Um, and the truth is whether you come at this from a landlord or tenant perspective, um, it's undoubtedly the case that uh, COVID-19 um, has had a huge impact on those who own or lease property because um, whilst there are obviously a limited number of essential businesses uh, such as supermarkets which remain open, um, the vast majority have had their operations curtailed or their premises completely closed to help fight the spread of the virus. Um, obviously we've seen huge support announced by the Chancellor already uh, but despite that we saw uh, reports that only 48.2% of the March quarter rent was collected by major listed landlords um, and there's been many tenants including the likes of McDonald's and Boots who have openly requested freezes or discounts whilst other big name tenants reportedly paid no rent at all. Um, a powerful group of tenants are now campaigning for a nine month rent uh, free period for the hospitality sector with a commensurate term extension uh, to the lease so that no rent is lost. Uh, tensions have risen uh, and there have been accusations of bad faith and exploitative behaviour on the part of some tenants uh, and some landlords have also been accused of using aggressive rent collection techniques. Um, Inchu, uh, the listed shopping centre giant, apparently received only 29% of rent due to it for the March quarter uh, and has already announced it's considering legal action against tenants who it considers can meet rent payments but are not engaging in negotiations to do so. Uh, I think what is true is that both landlords and tenants are suffering a decrease in income. Um, and of course, there's a huge um, uh, uncertainty as when we might return to the, or what was called the old normal. Um, anyway, just some housekeeping points. Um, as a reminder, we are recording this webinar. webinar. Uh, it will be available to you to view afterwards via the Owen Mitchell website. Uh, we've also got a number of other webinars uh, there within our coronavirus hub section and I think you can also view it on YouTube. Um, and thank you to those already submitted questions. We've had rather a, a large number already. Uh, if you'd like to ask some questions throughout then please submit them via the Q&A function on your screens. Uh, we'll try to answer them at the end together with those already submitted. Um, if we don't have time to deal with them today then we'll contact you afterwards and try to deal with them and assist you at that point. Um, so I'll cross over now to James, who's going to provide an update on key changes we have seen and are likely to see in the coming weeks. James. Thanks very much, Paul. So there are five key changes that we're going to be covering today. The first is Section 82 of the Coronavirus Act 2020, which is a new piece of legislation brought in to respond to the challenges that the virus is posing. So this bans landlords from thwarting tenants leases for non-payment of rent or other sums due under the tenancy during what's called the relevant period. So that goes from the 26th of March 2020 and currently ends on the 30th of June 2020, although the Secretary of State has the power to extend this. Landlords can still forfeit for non-payment of rent on other grounds, such as if their tenant uh, assigns without consent, uh, where consent is required. The forfeiture ban covers all tenancies and subtenancies which fall within the protection of the Landlord and Tenants Act 1954, and that's whether they're contracted out of the protection of the Act, which I'll talk about later, or, or not. Uh, it also covers lawful licensees occupying premises let under such a protected tenancy. 
uh, non-payment of rent um, before or during the relevant period is also to be disregarded when considering the uh, the effect of Section 31B, uh, which is one of the grounds on which a landlord can oppose uh, giving a tenant a new lease. Um, persistent, and the ground is that opposition to a new tenancy due to persistent delay in paying rent. Otherwise, there is no direct change to the law for lease renewals. But though the focus of the talk today is commercial property, we've had a few residential queries, so I just take this opportunity to note that Section 81 and Schedule 29 of the Coronavirus Act provide that almost all residential tenants must be given not less than three months' notice in writing before the landlord can seek uh, possession of the property. So the second key update is the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions England Regulations 2020. Now uh, you'll have heard about this in the uh, in the news um, a lot because this is the piece of legislation that keeps everyone at home and means that people have to work from home unless they they can't do so. So the Secretary of State must review the need for the restrictions and requirements in the regulations every 21 days, and the next uh, review is due on the 7th of May, so this week. Um, and if the Secretary of State believes that the restrictions or, or, or requirements are no longer necessary, then uh, he or she must uh, then terminate those restrictions and requirements. Overall, the regulations uh, order the closure of large swathes of the British economy and have detailed restrictions on how the remaining parts of the economy can stay open. It also imposes tight controls on when and for what purposes people can leave their homes. I won't go into the, the full text of all the regulations, uh, but the key point is that of those businesses that are allowed to, to stay open, they have substantial restrictions on their operation and that most shops other than essential shops such as supermarkets have been completely closed. This is obviously a very uh, a, a big problem for a lot of businesses out there. In, in addition, Regulation 6 states that no person may leave the place where they're living without reasonable excuse which includes uh, to obtain basic necessities, to exercise, traveling for work or charitable purposes where it is not possible to work, provide those services from home, to fulfill a legal obligation or to participate in legal proceedings and to access critical public services. So that is going to have quite an important role as we will talk about later on um, how landlords and tenants can, can still use their property to the extent that they can and also how um, a landlord would go or a tenant would go about renewing or terminating a lease. There's also a restriction on public gatherings of no more than two people and the police are given uh, wide ranging powers with which to enforce these new regulations. So the next uh, key update is practice direction 51Z of the civil procedure rules. So the civil procedure rules govern all court proceedings uh, in England and Wales um, and this new practice direction has been issued by the, uh, by the court in an attempt to uh, stop people losing their homes or, or commercial premises as a result of coronavirus. And what it means is that all possession proceedings or applications to carry out an eviction are stayed until the 25th of June 2020, with a couple of exceptions. So the two main exceptions are uh, to claim possession of property back from a trespasser where there's no previous uh, relationship between the landlord and the trespasser. So this is what we call persons uh, unknown. So uh, it can be someone that the landlord doesn't know and it certainly excludes former tenants. You can also bring a claim for what's called an interim possession order, which is generally considered to be a less effective form of claim for possession against trespassers. Um, but it does remain a possibility in the current times. Um, it is still possible to obtain objunctions uh, both to enter premises and to remove people from them. But an important thing to note is that injunctions are a discretionary remedy and the court is, um, it is up to the court to decide whether or not uh, that is granted and the landlord has no legal right to the injunction. It's what we call an equitable remedy. And so the court is going to need uh, strong evidence uh, and good and convincing reasons uh, that the landlord should be allowed possession back uh, during a public health emergency. So there was a recent case called University College London Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and MB in which uh, the hospital sought possession of a hospital room against a, a patient who no longer needed treatment but had refused to leave and the bed was urgently needed for another patient. So in that case the judge was willing to, uh, to, to grant the injunction to remove them from the property 
Uh, but that's a fairly exceptional set of circumstances. And certainly we wouldn't expect the court to, uh, to allow landlords to use this routinely to recover possession of property during the crisis for the usual reasons such as non-payment of rent. The next piece of legislation is the taking control of goods and certification of enforcement agents uh, coronavirus regulations 2020. Uh, this came into force on 20th of April and it affects what we call commercial rent arrears recovery or what you might have heard of uh, previously as sending in the bailiffs. So that is where a tenant hasn't paid their rent and the landlord enters the property, takes some of the tenant's goods and sells them to recover the, the rent money. Now these uh, set of regulations increase the minimum amount of unpaid rent that there must be for the landlord to use this procedure from seven days to 90 days. So quite a big increase. The intention being that the, the tenant would have to be in more than three months of arrears before the landlord can, could, uh, could exercise this right. And uh, that particular restriction will be enforced for so long as Section 82, which we covered previously, the forfeiture ban, uh, remains in force. Uh, the next piece of legislation, this is not something that's coming to force yet, but it is going to have a big impact when it does, is the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill. So the government has already announced that it is going to temporarily void uh, statutory demands and prevent landlords from serving such demands or presenting winding up petitions. So with respect to statutory demands, uh, they will be temporarily banned between the 1st of March 2020 and the 30th of June 2020 and winding up petitions presented from Monday the 27th of April through to the 30th of June will not be allowed to proceed but only in those cases where the company cannot pay its bills due to coronavirus. It's not clear how the, the court is going to sift out those cases due to coronavirus from those uh, due to other reasons. Um, and hopefully when the bill is published, we will have more information on this. Um, one thing also is it's not clear whether tenant guarantors will receive the same protection as tenants themselves, or if uh, it may be possible uh, by serving notice, for, for example, uh, for the landlord to, to approach the guarantor and ask them to pay the rent the tenant isn't willing to pay. But the overall effect of these changes is that it is intended to preserve the current state of affairs and prevent tenants from losing their premises, goods or being wound up as a result of coronavirus. And you can understand the, the, the public policy reasons for this. It's intended to be accompanied by a package of support for both landlords and tenants. And I think with respect to tenants, I think that the package is there and the tenants are well protected by the new rules. However, I'd say landlords are probably currently less protected against a drop in rental income uh, as it stands. However, uh, you may have seen in the press that there are discussions ongoing between landlords and the government with respect to the furloughed space grant scheme. Now this scheme, if it was created, intends to furlough properties uh, which are not being used so that the government will pick up the rent bill during the crisis. If this is put through and made law, uh, it would be a massive lifeline to landlords who are unable to get suitable funding uh, from the other government schemes and it appears that, that some of those landlords are falling through the cap, cr uh, the, crap, uh, the, uh, the cracks of the, uh, the current uh, uh, legislation. Um, so now that I've covered those, those, those key changes, um, Paul, what are the options for a landlord to terminate a lease in the current environment? Uh, well, in my case, uh, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, in light of what uh, you've updated with us there, James, um, the options are actually rather limited. Um, putting to one side the issue as to whether a landlord would want to terminate a lease for some reason, with all the issues that come along with having a vacant property, um, it's worth noting that they can still uh, seek to forfeit for non-payment uh, for non-rent breaches of lease covenant, uh, but they would first need to serve what's known as a Section 146 notice. Um, that remedy is not covered by Section 82 of the Coronavirus Act, uh, which only applies a moratorium on forfeiture action against the tenant for non-payment of rent. Um, briefly, a Section 146 notice is required to be served by a landlord on a tenant for any breaches of covenant uh, other than uh, to pay rent. Uh, I must specify the breach complained of and confirm whether that breach is capable of remedy and if it is required the tenant to do so. Um, now, if a breach can be remedied, uh, the Section 146 notice must provide details as to what the tenant needs to do and must specify a reasonable period in which the tenant uh, needs to do it. Now, what is a reasonable time depends on the facts of each case, but clearly in the current circumstances, 
um, tenants will be needed to be provided with additional time to try to remedy those breaches set out in the section 146 notice um, before a landlord could be confident to issue forfeiture proceedings. Um, I think it's also worth noting that there's no exception for commercial premises in the 90 day stay of possession proceedings brought about by uh, practice direction 51Z uh, that James mentioned earlier. Uh, so there's going to be a natural delay in obtaining possession order uh, if the landlord decided to forfeit by the issuing of court proceedings on the back of that section 146 notice where the tenant hadn't remedied the specified breach. Um, the other method for a landlord to forfeit is of course by a peaceable re-entry, uh, so changing the locks. Um, and they can do that again once the section 146 notice has been served and the reasonable period given uh, uh, to the tenant um, ha has expired. Um, but uh, tenants in that situation obviously have the usual right to apply to the court for relief from forfeiture and they can do that up to um, six months later. So, you know, landlords in that situation have been in a very uncertain position during that relief period. Um, and I'd expect the courts who always have a very wide discretion when considering relief from forfeiture applications are going to adopt a very sympathetic approach to tenants in the current environment. Um, this is especially the case where we know that, that, that courts traditionally um, lean against forfeiture. Uh, they don't really like it wherever possible. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, so what would you say the options are for a tenant to terminate their lease? Um, tenants might have uh, better commercial reasons for wanting to terminate the lease. Um, but in reality, there are now also a limited number of options available for them to do so. Um, the first argument is around the doctrine of frustration, um, and there's been a lot of ink spilt by practitioners as to whether the current situation might allow a tenant to claim that their lease has been frustrated. Um, in fact, practitioners have been so desperate to try and find an argument to support this, they're having to rely on cases relating to the prohibition area period in the uh, United States in order to do so. Um, in summary, it's very difficult for a tenant to, to succeed um, as evidenced by the fact that there's actually no reported case in England and Wales with a tenant ever successfully arguing its lease has been frustrated. Um, just briefly, um, the doctrine of frustration of a contract uh, occurs when an unforeseen event takes place after that contract has been completed, um, which results in the contract becoming impossible to perform. Um, the frustrating event uh, has arisen um, through no fault of either of the parties. So in this case, obviously COVID-19 is, is neither the fault of the landlord or the tenant. Um, and the contract itself must not have provided uh, for the particular eventuality in the drafting. Um, the, the effect of if the contract is frustrated um, is that it, it is brought to an end uh, and both parties are released from performance and in fact can recover any made monies paid under that contract. Um, including arguably a rent deposit, uh, although I must uh, stress that hasn't um, actually been tested in the courts either yet. Um, but on the face of it, potentially it's a very attractive option for a tenant looking to get out of their lease. Um, we do have case law authority uh, that confirms frustration does apply to leases, which of course interests in land and not necessarily contracts in the true sense. Um, but I think the reality is no tenant will really want to argue frustration. It's going to be time consuming, legally very expensive and also incredibly uncertain. Um, I think any court proceedings are extremely unlikely to be heard before the lockdown restrictions uh, have actually been um, e uh, have actually been eased and, and may no longer even move with us. Um, I think the reality is tenants might not want to pay all of their rent at the moment. But they don't necessarily want to be out of the premises, which is the effect of, uh, of frustrating the lease. Um, and in all of, but a handful of, um, of the shortest of seasonal leases and pop-up shop, for instance, I think frustration is unlikely to succeed. Um, if we look at the reality of the current situation, which James outlined earlier, we're effectively in a rolling three-week shutdown by the government, um, and it's under constant review. So that's of such a sort of temporary nature um, that I don't think it's very difficult to argue that it removes all of the benefit that one party receives from the lease. Um, the most recent case on frustration was actually heard last year in the High Court in Canary Wharf against the European Medicines Agency, uh, where the tenant in that case, uh, the European Medicines Agency or EMA, uh, failed to extricate itself from a long lease uh, because the court felt that the uh, assignment and subletting provisions within that lease meant that they were not able uh, to argue frustration um, because whilst the UK leaving the EU, 
uh, might have frustrated the original tenant's use for the premises and the EMA needed to be located in, a, in an EU member state. Um, those premises could still be used by an assignee or subtenant, so there's, there remains some benefit in the lease. Um, I think in short, the difficulty for you know, bars, restaurants and shops is that a six, nine or 12 week uh, extension, whatever it might be, is unlikely to be sufficient in the context of a two or a five or a 10 year lease to constitute frustration. Um, there's some support for this from um, a 2004 case in Hong Kong where a tenant in a two year fixed term residential tenancy, um, he was actually ordered out of his block because of the SARS outbreak, um, but only for 10 days. Um, and in those circumstances, he couldn't argue that his agreement had been frustrated. Um, so there may be some argument where you have a short term agreement. Uh, for instance, if you've agreed to take a pop up shop for a period of a month, let's say over the last month in a shopping centre, then I think you may well qualify. But then I'd query whether there's any any value in taking such a small uh, matter to court. Um, there may also be some argument where you've got a, a lease with a very short period left to run. Uh, and a user covenant that restricts the use of the premises uh, to a purpose or purposes all of which are impossible to meet uh, in light of the current regulations. Um, they may have a chance of arguing frustration, but I'd probably put it no higher than, than a chance at the moment. Um, so that takes me on to another option uh, which provides landlords and tenants with an opportunity to terminate the term of their lease early. Uh, that's of course break options in leases. Um, this section has got a more of a, a tenant focus um, because when I'm going on to discuss conditions, these normally apply to break options operated by tenants rather than landlords um, and actually are the root of some considerable practical difficulties in the current lockdown environment. Um, now our first tip I think would be don't try and serve uh, a break notice yourself, please get advice. It's easy to get wrong um, and if you're a tenant you can leave yourself bound into the remainder of the lease term uh, and obviously all the obligations including paying rent for that the remainder of that term. And um, I think that's going to be especially true in the current environment where I expect landlords are going to be looking to keep tenants um, to avoid having empty premises and they'll look at taking any point they can on the validity of break notices. Um, so a bit of a plug, we, we do serve a significant number of break notices on behalf of clients in our national real estate disputes team. Um, and many of those notices are conditional on compliance with covenants. Um, the most important, important point about break notices and the conditions attached to them is that they need to be strictly adhered to. Um, there's a wealth of case law which states that a failure to comply with conditions in a break clause uh, means it will not be validly exercised. Um, break clause is very strictly construed by the courts who consider um, the parties have you know, carefully negotiated the terms of their lease at the outset and certainly a break clause and any conditions attached to it, which would be a, a fundamental term of that, that lease, is something the courts consider have been you know, very carefully uh, negotiated and drafted. Um, so just very quickly, um, some basics as to what strict compliance means. Uh, firstly, break notices should always be in writing and service of such notices always in accordance with the, the lease uh, and any sta stated statutory re regime that may apply. Um, so this actually requires a very detailed examination and consideration of your lease and, and the wording of the break option. Um, as real estate litigators, I think James and I probably have an unhealthy interest in the service provisions that are contained in the lease. Um, it's usually found in the uh, notices or subsection of a, of a lease because um, there are numerous different service clauses and leases with differing deeming provisions. Um, as to when the notice is actually deemed to have been served and that obviously needs careful consideration so you don't miss any time limits. Um, there's no point serving a notice on the last day that could be served in accordance with the break option if it's going to be deemed served two working days later for instance pursuant to the notice provisions in the lease. And of course if you, you know, if you're serving a break notice you want to make sure the other party does actually receive it uh, to avoid any dispute. Um, so what can you do in the current circumstances? Well, if, if I was speaking to a tenant, I'd suggest we try uh, to get an up-to-date email address for the landlord and then ask the landlord to confirm they're happy to receive service of that notice by email uh, and also seek an up-to-date uh, residential or commercial address for them um, so we can serve a further copy of the written notice at those addresses. I suppose finally, if there's any doubt, uh, 
then we'd suggest using a process server. It costs £150, £200. They can attend the service address and attempt to uh, serve the notice by hand. Uh, we do know process servers who are still working uh, in accordance with the restrictions set out in the regulations. I think provided you give them clear and strict instructions uh, on where and how to serve, um, they can do so and then they'll also provide you with a written statement of the steps that they took. Thanks very much, Paul. Um, so are there any particular break conditions that are worth noting? Um, a common condition that we see attached to break options is that rent should be paid up to the break date. Uh, and I think a good point to note here is that there's nothing that the government have legislated about in the past few weeks, uh, which allows tenants not to pay their rent. Uh, in fact, um, Section 82 of the Coronavirus Act 2020 actually says that it's assumed that rental liability actually continues. Um, so it actually means that so while some premises are closed completely um, in order to uh, comply with the health uh, regulations, uh, a tenant who is faced with a break condition requiring them to pay rent to effectively comply with the condition will have to do so. Um, a review of the lease and the break option uh, is vital as care should be taken to ensure that the rent required to be paid in order to comply with the break option is actually the correct rent. Um, it may be the required rent is defined not only as the principal rent, but perhaps also the service charge and insurance rent and in in any interest. Um, I think perhaps the most difficult break condition for tenants to try and comply with at present um, is the condition to provide vacant possession uh, in the lease in order to validly exercise their break. Um, so what does vacant possession mean? Well, I think that's a topic in its own right. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, it requires property, property to be free of any subtenancies or occupiers, um, and the tenant must have removed all of their goods. Um, the landlord must be able to uh, have what's been described as the immediate use and occupation of that premises without any substantial impediment. Um, I think, of, as I've alluded to, the vacant possession conditions have spawned a huge amount of litigation over the years. Um, but what it require, requires in practical terms is a tenant um, either having to physically attend themselves or arrange someone else to attend the premises uh, in order to remove goods and items of their fit out. Um, now, as we heard from James, um, the health regulations during the lockdown period provide that no person can leave their home without a reasonable, reasonable excuse. So there's obviously going to be logistical issues here. Um, I'm afraid there's no real easy answer uh, as to how a tenant deals with this. But the first thing to consider is the construction of the particular break option itself. Um, if the break option is tempered by perhaps requiring reasonable compliance with the conditions, uh, then the current COVID-19 situation is clearly going to be relevant uh, when considering whether a tenant has complied or not. Um, if you compare this with the requirement for a tenant to materially comply, uh, that obviously clearly denotes a requirement for much stricter adherence to the stipulated break conditions, um, then I think the tenants can have a bigger problem. But of course, the first question to address if there is a dispute on compliance with a vacant possession condition is going to be, well, why can't the tenant comply with this, with this condition? And although each case and obviously type of premises uh, must be considered on its own, uh, own facts, um, arguably, the current health regulations don't prevent some business owners from accessing their premises in order to remove or assist in removing or arranging to remove their goods and, um, and fit out. Um, also, as James mentioned, um, it's only a temporary restriction at present. So if there's a condition requiring compliance, vacant possession in a few months time, there's no reason that at the moment can't be complied with. Um, a tenant can arrange for a surveyor or a contractor uh, to attend, provided they are happy to safely undertake the, the assignment given to them, and they can assess the premises and un undertake any required work um, to comply with the vacant possession condition. Um, I think in all cases, though, the tenant's going to need to ensure uh, they consider the restrictions on movement of people under the regulations, and they themselves must not leave their homes, obviously, without this reasonable, reasonable excuse. Um, now, that's not defined, but uh, a tenant who is required to deliver vacant possession arguably needs to access their premises and this is not something they can do working from home. Um, it's also been suggested that they could argue they are fulfilling a legal obligation which is obviously one of the permitted uh, exceptions to regulations that James mentioned 
Um, but I think that's more relating to the legal proceedings rather than complying with the contractual obligation. Um, I think the point to note is that, you know, as a tenant, you must be mindful of the responsibilities to any employees and your contractors uh, by ensuring that uh, any social distancing rules are maintained uh, when undertaking any work uh, required to comply with the, the vacant possession condition. Um, plan well ahead of time um, so that any delays are also factored in. Um, I think in most cases, the position is going to be that whilst it's undoubtedly more difficult to comply with the vacant possession condition, it's not necessarily going to be impossible. Um, I've actually advised on a recent case uh, where the landlord of an arcade um, where the subject premises are situated um, had shut it down so our, our tenant client couldn't actually comply with the vacant possession and repair conditions attached to their break option. Um, fortunately, the break option was a rolling one. Uh, so we, we have agreed in that case with the landlord we're going to serve a new break, a break notice uh, on the basis that the existing one uh, won't be complied with and will fail. Uh, and our client's going to get a three month rent free period to do the required uh, works. Um, we had suggested to the landlord uh, that they agree to waive the conditions attached to the break, but um, that's not something that they were prepared to do and I can understand that. Um, so obviously, fortunately, in this case, the landlord adopted a practical and reasonable approach, but you can see that there will be litigation um, if the values at stake make it worthwhile to do so. And I think, you know, if or should I say when such litigation ensues, um, we may well be back to arguments from tenants over frustration and possibly even implied terms being used to argue they should be allowed to uh, argue their lease has been validly terminated by the break notice. Um, if that's the case, we'll obviously update you on those cases in, in due course. Um, so now I've covered those uh, issues on terminating leases, I'm going to turn to renewing leases and James, uh, you said there's little change in how tenants renew their leases, but could you summarise how lease renewals work? Uh, yes, thank you, Paul. Um, so to begin with basics, under part two of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954, all tenants who have leases that are of or include premises occupied by the tenant, the purposes of its business, or for those and other purposes, have a right to a new lease at the end of the old tenancy, unless the landlord and tenant have chosen to exclude that right, which is called contracting out, or the right is not excluded, but the landlord can lawfully oppose giving the tenant a new tenancy, and there are seven grounds that the landlord can rely on in that case. If the tenant stays in occupation of the property for the purposes of its business beyond the fixed term of the lease, and was in occupation on the last day of the fixed term, and that's the critical part, the lease will not end and will continue until it's terminated by a method allowed by the Act. This is called holding over, you may have heard that before. If nothing else happens, the lease just continues and will remain on the same terms as in the original written lease. However, if the landlord and tenant want to agree a new lease or end the existing lease, they can serve notice to do so. If the tenant decides to have a new lease, most of the terms of that uh, new lease uh, in negotiation with the landlord uh, will need to be similar to the old one, subject to what we call reasonable modernization or updating. Uh, but the rent for the property will be paid to the market rent. Normally, this means that tenants will be seeking new leases when the rent is going down and landlords will be seeking new leases when it is going up. The parties can also claim what's called an interim rent, uh, which covers the period from the earliest date that the party could have served their notice, um, take from the standpoint of the day they served it on, um, to when uh, the new lease is agreed or the tenant decides it does not want a new lease. If the market rent drops as a result of COVID-19, for example, we might expect more tenants to serve notice in an attempt to reduce their rent from the earliest possible date. For the same reason, landlords may delay serving notice if they can. Now, landlords can only effectively serve one type, main type of notice, uh, which is a notice giving their tenants six to 12 months notice, terminating the current tenancy, um, and either offering the terms of a new lease or opposing the grant of a new lease on one or more of these grounds of opposition, and that notice can expire no earlier than the last day of the fixed lease term. The current tenancy will end on the date in the landlord's notice, unless the landlord and tenant agree in writing to extend that time under one of the provisions of the, the 1954 Act, or one of them applies uh, to court for a new lease, and both the landlords and tenants are able to apply. Uh, from the tenant's point of view, the tenant can either give at least three months notice to terminate the tenancy without requesting a new one, 
uh, and that notice expiring no earlier than the last day of the fixed term. Or they can give between six and 12 months notice to terminate the current tenancy and propose terms for a new one. In this case, the current tenancy will end on the day before the day the tenant puts in their notice for the new lease to start. So if it's able to start on the 2nd of May, the lease would end on the 1st of May. Um, and it, the, the lease will end on that date um, unless the landlord and tenant agree in writing to extend the period or one of the parties applies to court. So the key point here is if a notice has been served, uh, particularly one that may be expiring fairly uh, uh, sort of around this time, um, then just be aware of the deadline and seek to agree extensions of time if required. If the other party won't agree, then you should seek urgent legal advice about issuing proceedings in order to stop your lease ending if that's what you would like to do. Um, thanks, James. So um, what issues does the current COVID-19 crisis uh, pose for landlords and tenants uh, considering the, uh, renewing a lease at the moment? Thanks very much, Paul. Um, so there are a few. So as with break options, because of the potential delay in the postal system and difficulties with serving notices in person, the parties need to allow plenty of time to serve the notice and to acquire evidence that they have done it. Um, this is often using a special delivery slip or a witness statement from a process server. Lease renewals normally involve more contact between landlord and tenant and the break options um, and, include, and can include, for example, agreeing extensions of time to continue the lease negotiations. As many people have been furloughed though, or perhaps, perhaps had to change their job role, you will need to make sure that the person you're dealing with uh, is able to agree an extension of time if you need one. However, the most likely issue with COVID-19 in the context of lease renewals is that if the tenant is not attending their premises due to the regulations, this could affect whether they're deemed to have been in occupation of the property for the purpose of the, its business on the last day of the lease term. If they're said not to be in occupation, the lease will end on the last day and will not continue. This could obviously have big implications. The courts look favourably on tenants wanting to remain in occupation and previously have interpreted the requirement to be in occupation widely as a result. It can mean that, uh, that there are staff at the premises, for example, but it can also include whether the tenant is simply exercising control over the premises but isn't there every day. So there are a few examples from previous cases that you might find helpful to, to understand how the court might approach this, this particular question about occupation. So for example, the court has held in the following circumstances that the tenant was still in occupation. Uh, that includes the presence of a carpet, uh, a carpet layer, fitting carpets for the occupation by the tenant and the visits of the tenant's personnel on two occasions near to the end of the lease keeping rubber shoes in the basement of a shop, even though the tenant had ceased to trade from there. A tenant who was forced to vacate because of a fire was held to still be in occupation because they could show that they intended to return as soon as physically possible. And the property was unusable for two years in one case, leading up to the expiry of the lease following a fire. Although the tenant had taken new premises in the interim, the court held he was still in occupation for the purposes of the act because he intended to return and the judge in that case actually gave some advice to tenants, saying that tenants in this position should make it clear to the landlord their intention to exert and claim their rights of occupancy. So we can see from these cases, particularly the ones where the tenant left because of a fire or uncontrollable uh, reason, that if the tenant leaves because of COVID-19, uh, but intends to return, that the court would probably find that they were still in occupation, so long as they were asserting their right or interest to return once restrictions are lifted. So from a landlord's perspective, this may mean that tenants who have not vacated or served formal notice to end their lease, uh, such as the three month tenants notice I mentioned, uh, will still be their tenants after their leases expire and so would still be liable for the rent and business rates. And looking at it from the tenant's perspective, this means it is very important to tell your landlord what you want. If you want to stay, you should make it clear in writing. If you want to go and the fixed term of the lease is near to its end, then ideally you should serve three months notice to ensure the lease ends when you intend it to and to reduce your rent and rates liability. Thanks, uh, James. Um, do you think you could just sort of sum up some concluding remarks for everyone on just what we've covered so far? Uh, yes, of course. Um, so overall, if you wish to renew or terminate a lease, plan ahead and take proper legal and surveying advice on the implications of doing so. Uh, 
it may take a lot longer than normal to put your plans into action. COVID-19 will have the strongest impact, we feel, on break options, where the practical difficulties of removing goods from the premises and doing works to them uh, may be very difficult, practically impossible, or even in some cases illegal. And uh, you should always seek legal advice if you're not sure about, for example, the interpretation of the regulations. If the government can put in place a package of support to support both landlords and tenants, however, then hopefully they will be able to take a longer view on their desire to renew or terminate a lease, rather than needing to focus, um, rather than needing to focus on short-term concerns such as paying rent and avoiding uh, void periods. So I think overall, the key to maintaining uh, making lease terminations and lease renewals work for you during COVID-19 is to keep your lines of communication open between uh, you and the other party, your landlord or your tenant. Although I appreciate it is very difficult to do it at this time of, of national crisis, to, to try and think strategically and consider the medium and long-term pros and cons of terminating existing lease or agreeing a new one. And above all, protect your position by serving notices if you need to and agreeing extensions of time where required. Um, so we're going to, in a moment, move into the next part of this, uh, this presentation, which is a, a Q, uh, question and answer session. Um, but before we do this, I've just got a couple of things to just say about this series of seminars that uh, Owen Mitchell is putting on. So these are weekly events. And if you've got any feedback on the kind of subjects you'd like to hear from us, then please let us know. Um, on the owenmitchell.com website, we have what's called our coronavirus hub. And that pulls together all of the different um, articles, podcasts, webinars that we've been doing in one place so that our clients and interested parties can, can, can benefit from that advice. Um, so if you go onto the main owenmitchell.com webpage, um, there will be a, a, a link for the Coronavirus Hub and you can click on that to take you to, to all of this content. And, uh, and please let us know your feedback uh, on, the, on this, uh, this talk. So participants can send questions through after the event via the events at erwinmitchell.com link, which my colleague has kindly put on the screen. Um, and uh, I believe my, uh, our events team will post a link to the feedback survey uh, in a moment, um, which you can use to give us feedback on, on how we've done um, and what you enjoyed and, uh, and otherwise. Um, so moving on, um, we've now got the question and answer section. So we, we've had a, a very large number of uh, questions from people, for which we're very grateful. Um, and uh, some have been submitted in advance. So we're going to start with those. And then um, if you have any other questions uh, that you think of as you go along, um, you can type them into the, the question and answer box on your screen. And uh, time permitting, we will try and, uh, we'll try and get through those. Um, so uh, Paul, would you like to, to start us off? Yeah, thanks, James. Um, so uh, we've had our first uh, question was from David, who said um, uh, there's been talk about tenants requesting a pandemic clause in new leases. Uh, what would this need to contain? Um, I have to confess I've, I've not seen that yet, but um, having think about it, I think um, this might be included as a, um, a an event within the rent cessor clause. Um, which is where the landlord obviously obtains insurance um, to cover events um, where the, the tenant can't pay the rent. And usually this applies to physical damage to the premises. Um, but it might be that the, the tenant requires them to, to get insurance cover for uh, pandemics. Um, I think the issue is going to be that will be very expensive, um, even if you'll find an insurer willing to, to provide that, that cover. And obviously a tenant will be actually picking up that cost. Uh, it was obviously in an FRI lease, whilst the landlord places the insurance, uh, the tenant pays for it. Um, another option I considered would be whether, <coughs> excuse me, you could include this um, as a triggering event um, for a tenant break option. Um, but then I'd query whether a landlord would actually be prepared to agree to this. Um, I think it's probably unlikely because obviously all the risk will then be on them of another pandemic occurring and their tenant just uh, simply serving notice and walking away. Um, it's a negotiated point, I suppose, but I think in return, a landlord would want significantly higher uh, rent for, for, for assuming that risk. Um, I hope that's answered that question. Uh, right, so the, uh, the next question we have is from Tom. 
who's, uh, who's, who's queried uh, what uh, options there are for tenants about early termination. Um, thanks for the question. Um, so I think this has hopefully been answered largely by the talk, which in which uh, Paul went through uh, some of the different options, such as uh, frustration uh, or break options. Um, I think the thing to take away is that unless there is a break clause in the lease uh, the that the tenant can exercise, the tenant will likely struggle to escape from the lease before the contractual term expires, unless it's a very short lease uh, or there are particular circumstances which might allow the tenant to rely on a frustration argument. And as Paul said, this hasn't been tested in the courts, or at least not successfully for a tenant. Um, so it's very much a case of watching this space. And I'm sure someone will will try that argument in the near future, and we just need to to see how that goes. Uh, Paul, do you want to deal with the next one? Sure. Um, yes. So we had a query from um, Sue, um, and I'll sort of paraphrase her query, which that was that um, she's got a break clause. Uh, which you cannot, um, can give three months notice to terminate early, but obviously in the current uncertainty, she's not sure to find alternative premises in time uh, by the time it expires. Uh, and can she then therefore serve her notice on a conditional basis? Um, it's actually a more complicated answer to this than you might assume, um, because generally speaking, break notices cannot be conditional. conditional. Um, I think it's very important to note they also cannot be withdrawn even if both parties agrees because um, it's considered in law to be a surrender of the lease uh, and the creation of a new lease on the same terms. Now that's not good for either party um, because a landlord could end up with a tenant with a, um, a lease that's protected by the 1954 Act and also lose the protection um, of any existing guarantors they had under the current lease. Um, the position is, you know, as a tenant, you've got to serve your notice um, and obviously be very sure about about what you know, you know your, your plans. Um, there are options, of course. Um, you could serve a, a notice, and if there's any conditionality to that notice, um, it is possible you could just not comply with those conditions. Uh, in the same way that the example I gave of the client I'm advising at the moment. Um, if you obviously you could not comply with this if you wanted to stay. Um, uh, however, the risk will be that if the landlord is, actually wants you to leave, um, they could also waive compliance with those conditions and some leases actually do provide for that. Um, so that the lease could end on that break day, um, provided the obviously you'd served a, a valid notice. So it's um it's actually a very complicated question. I would I would actually urge you to think very, very carefully before serving that notice because um, obviously the implications of, of doing so are quite severe if you um, if you can't actually comply with it and, and want to stay. Um, James, I think you're going to take the next one from Julian, I believe. Yes, uh, yeah, so thanks for the question, uh, Julian. Um, and he asks, uh, is this an opportunity for a tenant to make provision in the lease to be able to stop paying rent if something similar happens in the future? Um, the, the, the answer in short is yes, I'm sure many tenants will want to do that. And I'm sure particularly where they're negotiating a, a lease of, of property, a new lease or on uh, a lease renewal that tenants will want to insert some kind of provision uh, and landlords may want to insert some form of provision themselves as well. Um, so is that uh, the parties can't agree, however, on inserting the clause. Um, then it's down to sort of commercial negotiation uh, and bargaining positions as to who is going to, to win out there. Um, if it's a lease renewal, for example, and uh, you want to put that into the renewal lease. So the starting point is that the terms other than rent are normally um, are normally governed by the previous lease terms. However, I think the court is probably going to accept in, in inserting a pandemic clause is, is going to be a fair and reasonable thing to do. Um, it's just going to be the particular wording of that clause that will matter. So, for example, if the tenant asks for the clause and the landlord won't agree it, then it would be up to the court, if the release from your proceeding is ongoing, uh, to decide whether the new should, term should be included. Um, and the leading case, which is called OMEI, um, uh, uh, states that um, the onus is normally on the party who wants to include the term to show that the new clause is fair and reasonable for both parties, among other things. So I hope that uh, answers the question. And, uh, Thanks, uh, and, there's also, uh, and there's also a question here from, from Tom who's just asked about 
uh, damage limitation um, tips for tenants now that some leases are going forward are required but they can't afford to pay their way to trouble I think that's largely been answered in the talk um, uh, it, it is a difficult situation um, and I think it, it's parties landlords and tenants need to try where they can to work together uh, to find their way through uh, this, this crisis and then uh, Paul I think question from Caroline yeah, um, thanks, Caroline. You asked uh, what is the position at the moment where um, landlords and tenants are making oral agreements to vary lease terms? Um, well, I mean, assuming the lease is a deed, then you would usually uh, need another deed um, or a contract um, such as a side letter supported by consideration uh, in order to vary the lease. Uh, it's never a good idea um, to rely on oral agreements. Um, they just create huge amounts of mitigation, which are great for James and I, but uh, not for the parties. Um, I think we've got another Caroline here, James, who's asking another question. Uh, yes, we do indeed. Uh, hello, um, Caroline. Um, so she says that uh, my five year lease is um, ending uh, in 2021 and she can't uh, can no longer use the premises to tr uh, to serve clients. Um, and is going to be affected by COVID-19 and it's probably going to be in place uh, to the end of the lease, um, she feels. Um, the landlord has refused to reduce the rent or allow early termination unless she advertises in sublets and she's querying where she stands legally. Um, the answer to this one is, is a, a little, little bit complicated. It depends very much on the terms that are in your lease um, and it depends in particular on what the, the use that the lease is allowed to be for is. So if the, the user of the lease is solely restricted to your particular business type, um, then you might be able to argue that the lease has been frustrated because it's impossible for you to do anything with the property for the remainder of the lease term. Um, however, if there are other things you could do um, with the property, then um, it may be that the um, uh, that you, you wouldn't be able to make that argument because the, the court, you know, if it was to go to such a place, um, would, would say that there are other things you can do with that lease, such as the subletting. And I assume from, from the landlord's question that, that the lease must allow subletting. So it may be that um, you might want to sublet for another, another purpose uh, or to someone with a different business type. Um, but it's important to have a look at the, uh, the terms of, of the lease. And uh, as Paul said, in the Canary Wharf and EMA case he mentioned earlier, um, EMA lost essentially because, um, because they were able to assign or sublet. Um, so I think it's a case of looking at the terms of a lease, whether there's any other anything else you can do with it. Uh, trying to engage with the landlord if, if they will talk, or it sounds like it's, it's maybe not uh, going particularly well. Um, and then consider your options and, and maybe seek further advice on whether you might have such a frustration argument. But as Paul has said, it, it's, it's quite uncertain at the moment. James, okay. do you have a, a question from um, Sarah uh, saying, is there any update on the proposals regarding legislation to prevent winding up, winding up orders, please? Um, again, that was something that we we covered uh, in, in the talk, um, so hopefully that's been answered. Um, I think we've probably got about uh, four, five or six minutes left. So um, that's the questions we had um, submitted to us prior. Um, should we just have a look at the Q&A that's been going on whilst we've been talking and see if there's any of those? Um, you'll have to wait one second while we get those up. Yes, yeah, we're just uh, having a quick look now. Sorry, mine are not quite up yet. Have you have you okay. got any? I've, I've got I've got um, I've got some here. So there's a, a question um, on. I think it's someone with a residential tenancy just said, if the landlord has issued three months' notice to tenants to leave the property in accordance with the new rules, and tenants don't leave at the end of the three months, do they have? Uh, do you have to give a further three months' notice as part of the Section 21 process? Um, the answer to that would probably be no. Although the the coronavirus that has room in there for the Secretary of State to make amendments to the, the notice periods. But as it stands, the landlord gives three months notice and it expires. And then that would entitle them to commence court proceedings. Um, the only thing to bear in mind is because of the current stay on possession proceedings imposed by uh, practice direction 51Z, even if the landlord had served notice and it expired, um, the landlord can issue the proceedings, but nothing will happen with them until the stay is lifted 
And the courts have said that depending on how we're doing with the COVID-19 response, they may well extend um, extend that uh, that stay period further, which could mean that even if the proceedings are started, that they um, that they um, they wouldn't actually continue until a, a further period. Um, so yeah, we, have, we, we've oh, sorry, had another here from um, anonymous saying, um, "I'm not using my property. Can I ask for a re for a rent a reduction in rent or management charge?" Um, in short, yes, you can you can ask for uh, anything you like. Um, and um, I think our experience has been that, um, you know, landlords have been, um, uh, you, you know, for the most part, um, willing to discuss those um, uh, rent deferments or rent holidays, or, or even in certain circumstances, complete um, rent waivers. I think where the issues have, have come up is where tenants have simply gone quiet on their landlords and are just not communicating at all. That's where we've seen um, disputes happening. So. Uh, a bit like James was saying earlier, you know, keep in contact and, and, and request, um, you, you know, help from your landlord and, and, and see what they say. Um, I think it's important to note, as I said earlier, that, uh, you know, there is no um, legislation at the moment which, which says that you um, are not required to pay your rent. Um, so, you know, reaching an agreement with your landlord is the best way to proceed here. Um, management charge, I mean, assuming that's similar to the service charges, you, you know, you may also be able to argue that some of the services that the landlord um, provides uh, are not being provided at the moment um, and again that's uh, something to discuss with them. Um, James do you want to take the next question there? Uh, yes there's a question here um, hello we're in service offices we've tried to negotiate a discount on rent free period to no avail we now receive none of these services although the office managers are at pains to state that they are still open where do we stand? Uh, yeah, difficult situation um, this is ultimately I mean this may Sounds like it could be either a lease or, or a license. Uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 but because it takes a while to explain the difference, I won't go into the, the difference between those two types of agreements. But um, the answer is largely going to be the same, which is that it will depend on the term of the lease or license agreement. If there is a clause in there that allows for a reduction in the payment of those charges um, in these circumstances, um, then you may be able to to sort of insist on a on a reduction. But if not, uh, the, the principle will be that you would need to pay the charges in full. Um, however, I think it's probably again worth trying to discuss with the landlord, if possible, um, a way to to get through the current situation. Um, it is it is also possible we may it may be a case of looking at other terms in the lease and seeing if there's anything there that might suggest that in these circumstances you don't have to pay or you pay a reduced amount. But it, it is very specific to the particular lease wording. So I can't really give um, uh, much more sort of input uh, than that. Um, I think another thing to look at possibly James would be to ask the landlord, uh, the, uh, the, the service office provider in that situation, um, what measures they're putting in to allow for social distancing to take place within that workplace. Um, you know, you may have an agreement to take 80 uh, seats or, 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 or desks or whatever, however they, they charge you in, in, in your particular case. Um, but with social distancing, in fact, you can't you, you can't take 80 desks. It might be 30 desks. So mm. I think in those circumstances, you've got a, a, a good argument to say, well, hang on, um, you know, I, I want a reduction in my rent. Yes, I think that's a good point. And, and that some agreements may also factor that in, as you say, um, as a as part of the calculation of what the the, the rental service charge is. Um, so it's a case of looking at the whole of the, the lease or license agreement document and trying to see if there are any 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 support there to help you in this situation. Right, so um, we'll move to the next one. Yeah, I think it's probably the last one we've got, I think, James. Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, do, you, do you want to say that one, Paul? Uh, well, someone said, can I move offices? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but um, uh, we'll perhaps come back to that if you can provide a bit more detail on that one. And then Alan has said uh, rather than Section 146 is Jarvis versus Harris route better for landlords? Um, Jarvis versus Harris is obviously the notice that a landlord can serve on a tenant um, specifying um, certain repair works, for instance, that they want to be undertaken. Uh, and given the time to do it, and if they don't, the landlord will go in and do it themselves and charge uh, that cost back to the tenant as a debt. 
Um, I suppose um, I'm thinking the only issue with that is that obviously the the landlord's got to be able to, you know, arrange for um, con their own contractors to be able to do the required works in accordance with the social distancing um, and health regulations, just the same way in the tenant can. Um, uh, that would be my initial thoughts. James, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. Um, yeah, I, I take, yeah, thanks Paul. I, I take from the question that the, the concern is, is more about getting, fixing a problem in the property. Uh, yeah. and, and landlords do sometimes use a section 146 notice as a way to 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 make the tenant pay attention and you know I've had for example issues where um, there's been sort of uh, uh, sort of like air, air, air vents that are preventing fires and they haven't been maintained properly by the tenant and so the landlord serves a, a section 146 notice to say either do the work or we will terminate the lease. Um, so if that's the objective, then yes, a, a Jarvis and Harris clause could work. Yeah. Um, but it's a similar situation um, because if you if you forfeit the lease and go in and do it, then you're still going to have to deal with the tenant's relief application. Um, but you would be able to go in and do it. Um, if you if the objective is just to deal with the problem, Jarvis and Harris could potentially be better because you would then go in and do it. But you've still got all the practical problems caused by the regulations, lack of contractors, need to observe social distancing and also the there's the prescription uh, the um not prescription the uh, restriction in the regulations of uh, public gatherings of more than two people uh, mm -hmm. there is a there is an exception in there for where it's necessary for work but you can see how there might be uh, arguments or, or misunderstanding around whether this is really necessary at this time yeah i'd agree with that i think i think as a self-help remedy it perhaps is the way to go for landlords desperate to get those works undertaken um, but um, OK, well, look, I'm, I'm, apologies to everyone else on that um, Q&A list. We will um, endeavour to come back to you um, as soon as we can. So we, you know, answer as many of those queries as we can. Um, hopefully you would have seen our email addresses um, on the slides yeah. earlier. So feel free to, to forward those um, queries to us directly. Um, so, yeah, we're just over time now. So just like to thank you all again for your time today and hope you enjoyed it and found um, what, what we've said useful. Um, and uh, I wish you all the very best and, and stay safe. Yes, please uh, stay safe and I hope uh, you and your families are well. All right, thank you very much.